Good afternoon. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and these traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to the third lecture in our series, Intersections of Identity, Expression, Exchange, and Hybridity. The series asks, what constitutes identity? How do people navigate, form, and reform their sense of self? And how can the study of art and its history help us to consider the diverse identities expressed by visual culture and its creators? We seek to amplify the voices of scholars and artists whose work explores individual and collective identities, as those intersect with notions of the body, disability, gender, heritage, and race. The series is organized by KU's Crest Foundation Department of Art History and our History of Art graduate students Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Committee. It is sponsored by the Franklin Murphy Lecture Fund, and we present it in partnership with the Spencer Museum of Art, KU Department of Visual Art, Lawrence Art Center, Lawrence Public Library, Raven Bookstore, and other community partners. The graduate students and I want to thank Art History Department Office Manager Lisa Clore for all of her organizational help and acknowledge the creator of the poster for today's lecture, KU student Natalie LaPere. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dipti Kara, who is Associate Professor of Art History in the Department of Art History and the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. She holds an MA and PhD from Columbia University an MA from De Montfort University and a bachelor's degree from the Sir JJ College of Architecture, University of Mumbai. Dr. Kara is an art historian of early modern South Asia, whose research and teaching integrate Indian Ocean and Eurasian geographies and engage long durée or long duration perspectives from the medieval to the modern. Interdisciplinary training in art history, museum anthropology, and architecture define her critical and pedagogical practice. She has specialized in painted artifacts and early modern architecture, centered in and radiating out from Western India's regions of Rajasthan and Gujarat, and she has published on colonial taste and 19th century design and contributed to policy reports on contemporary heritage landscapes. She's a collaborator with the Global Horizons in Pre-Modern Art, an international initiative funded by the European Research Council through the University of Bern. She has held fellowships at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Forum for Transregional Studies Berlin, the American Institute of Indian Studies, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Yale Center for British Art, and Paul Mellon Center for British Art. Dr. Kara's recently published book, The Place of Many Moods, Udaipur's Painted Lands and India's 18th Century, out from Princeton University Press, is the first to use wide ranging artistic representations of place to trace the major aesthetic, intellectual, and political shifts in India's long 18th century. The book was recognized by the 2019 Edward Cameron Dimmock Jr. Prize from the American Institute of Indian Studies. Dr. Kara is currently at work on several innovative projects. One is the catalog for her co-curated exhibition, tentatively entitled, A Splendid Land, Paintings from Royal Udaipur, India, set to open at the Smithsonian's Freer and Sackler Galleries in November 22. Her next book project, Letters from the Local Bazaar, Unfurling Scrolls of Mobility and Scraps of Time in the Global Eras of Art History, follows messengers, monks, and merchants who walked with their bundled letter scrolls arriving at flourishing local bazaars of inland towns and port cities across Northern, Western and Eastern India. Dr. Kara's book, The Place of Many Moods has a website including the digital composite of a 72 foot long painted letter in a private collection made available for digital scrolling for the first time. She's currently collating a repository of many such scraps and scrolls spread across libraries and regional centers, excuse me, libraries and religious centers which has led her to consider how digital art history and network bandwidth enable demand and restrict collaborations. Another related project, a co-edited issue for Journal 18 appearing this fall, takes off from the phrase the long 18th century to explore from which vantage points and for whom is that century long. 
Dr. Kara asks, when the focus on histories of colonialism and slavery forces us to look anew at the bodies, lands, and knowledge presented in art, how does our thinking about the relative length or shortness, narrowness or breadth of the 18th century change? I'm sure those questions will resonate in her talk today on an 18th century subject, archive agency argument, mobilizing the knowledge of colonial India's native artists in global art histories. And there will be a question and answer session following the talk. So please type your questions in the chat on YouTube and members of the History of Art, graduate students, diversity, equity, accessibility and inclusion committee will moderate the discussion following. So I will now turn it over to Dipti Kara. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen before I speak and uh, I'm being told one participant can share at a time. I'm not getting the option to show the screen. You still trying? Uh, Anne has unshared her screen. Yeah, uh, let me try again. Speaking okay. of technical difficulties, if anyone can't access the chat on YouTube, just refresh it, please, and hopefully you'll get in. There we go. Okay, great. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, excellent. So uh, I'm glad to be finally here in this uh, very generous Zoom room. And uh, thank you first, Professor Kataporos, for this generous introduction and for this kind invitation. I thank all of your staff, including Lisa Plor, who made this event possible. Um, I thank the series partners as well. I know a lot of institutions and people have come together to create um, this um, series and this roster of events that you've been having. The Spencer Museum of Art, the KU Department of Visual Arts, Lawrence Arts Center, Lawrence Public Library, Raven Bookstore, Black Lawrence and other community partners. So thank you. Uh, I'm most grateful to your students, especially Mary Frances Ives, uh, who has coordinated the afternoon's proceedings with me um, and uh, also coordinated the proceedings and the design of this flyer with Natalie Leper. Uh, I thank her for the design because she juxtaposed the painting of the 1832 British Darbar that I um, gave to your committee uh, with a photograph of Udaipur's Lake Palace and Lake Water. So I was really moved by the research and the care that she took in perhaps imagining the kind of histories I might uh, bring to the fore, the archives or the picturesque moods that I might read against the grain. So I, I thank her for uh, thinking about certain ideas in the design of this poster and uh, sparking them for me as well. Um, and even though I cannot see all of the students and hear everybody's voices and um, um, see their faces, uh, I know that your department and especially your students has been doing a lot of work 
uh, in looking back at archives, in thinking about um, the fragile pasts that are not integrated into our present, um, and uh, in a variety of ways, including the recent graduate symposium hindsight. Uh, and I've been just catching up on the wonderful talks that were presented in that symposium. Um, so, and the kind of blind spots that were being highlighted in that. Uh, and in, in that vein, I, I think that some of the conversations you're having at KU um, have a lot to contribute to, uh, to other departments um, in thinking through their programming and how they are integrating these conversations and how they are being run by the students of the department. Uh, in that um, vein, I also thank uh, Rachel Quist, Annie Totten, and Vidita Rena, to whom I've just been introduced and who will be coordinating the Q&A. Um, I appreciate very much your thoughtful land acknowledgement, especially at the institutional and departmental level. Um, and I want to acknowledge the land on which I stand at an individual level. I'm joining you from New York City, which occupies the land of the Lenape people, past and present, who I acknowledge. Um, like you, I am striving to learn how to make my acknowledgement more meaningful, uh, how to enter into these acknowledgements as they are um, as they are in some ways the basis for the entire conversation that has um, gained further credence about what does it mean to decolonize art history and to do that not simply on metaphorical terms. Um, and I wanted to bring in uh, some of these recent calls that have been there to um, decolonize art history, which have um, which have emerged from a variety of contexts. So here on the screen, you see the issue of art history um, that was collated by um, Dorothy Price and her colleague in UK. Um, where they uh, very much like many of these uh, calls start with um, start with the call, historicize it very specifically with what students at the University of Cape Town in South Africa demanded in 2015. Uh, with the asking for the removal of the statue, um, uh, removal of the of the statue uh, of Cecil Rhodes uh, from their campus, um, and as this uh, as this call spread, uh, many universities, students, cities have tried to think about this question from their own grounds, right? Um, from the grounds they occupy and standing on grounds that have been uh, associated with that are part of very violent erasures and occupations, right? And UK has a lot to um, say or a lot to be responsible for in that. Um, this particular call that was there in art history that Catherine Grant and Dorothy Price put forward invited many scholars to think about these series of five questions that uh, what might it mean, what is the specificity of our calls to uh, decolonize art history, uh, what is the how does it affect our curriculums? How does it affect our very specific uh, fields? And as we think, uh, as they were, as they received these responses, as they received many of the critiques as well, in trying to again kind of push 
uh, both the editors and the scholars who responded uh, that this call is something that cannot be separated from action, especially because it was also very much related to the toppling of the statue in Bristol of Edward Colston. Um, and uh, in, in that, how do we enter into this debate not on metaphorical terms? Another um, questionnaire that I want to uh, bring to the fore is the one that was put forward by October more in the context of modern and contemporary art. And, uh, you know, my colleague here, the Africanist Professor Preeta Meyer, shared with me the response by Dr. Um, Nana Adusi Poku. And she talks about, you know, you can see what I have marked up, what we all are talking about, that how does art history um, think about the kind of disciplinary and institutional gatekeeping that takes place within the discipline? Uh, how does it think about its very specific history, uh, the legacies of Enlightenment and Europe, uh, slavery, colonialism, and looting that are central to the histories that have been produced? Uh, what does it mean to decolonize in practice? Uh, and I found myself writing as I was reading this piece that, um, you know, how the project of diversifying and decolonizing um, are related um, and not related in theory and practice as we redesign our curriculums, right? Uh, you also see that I wrote over there that my students are more willing to have these conversations rather than the gatekeepers themselves. Um, so I just, uh, you know, I wanted to bring these thoughts, these scribbles into the conversation uh, by way of, um, uh, by way of gesturing, uh, by way of uh, stressing that uh, I am having, um, in a way, a conversation with your students and with your community there um, on my pages as um, we look out for each other or we hear in some ways more of each other uh, in these Zoom worlds, right? Um, I also want to highlight from my own field the responses of two of my colleagues uh, in the decolonizing art history um, issue. Uh, that was the, the, the first issue, the first call for those five, four or five questions that I showed on the screen that respondents were asked to um, consider. Uh, here I have uh, excerpts from what Professor Kajri Jain, who is based at University of Toronto in Canada, responded, and uh, Professor Parul Dave Mukherjee, who is uh, located at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, how she responded. Um, it's important that uh, both of them, you know, um, from their own respective positions alert us to the history of decolonizing art history, but how we need to think of this not just as a metaphor, but also uh, to think about what are the histories through which, uh, or what are the phases uh, in which certain attempts for decolonizing have happened in the field, right? Um, they alert you to that, to think about post-colonial studies, to um, think about feminist histories, uh, to think about indigenous activism and uh, the kinds of annihilations of democracy that is taking place in their own very ground, in their very local context. Um, and in kind of, bringing both of those uh, positions from Toronto and Delhi, um, they 
ask in some ways to not forget that context within which one is producing these narratives, the context of the very land on which one resides, uh, the context of the kinds of burgeoning nationalisms that are taking over. Um, so in making a plea for not decolonizing on metaphorical terms, but looking at concepts, um, uh, you know, concepts that may come from different vantage points that might illuminate different ways of defining the terms that have been at the core of art history. Um, Parul Dave Mukherjee is mentioning my nieces over here, um, that one cannot be entering into a certain kind of uh, bracketed jingoism either, right? Um, I highlight all of these positions because I uh, hope to think with you today about one of my projects of uh, acknowledging, uh, of thinking that what is it, uh, what, what kind of work happens when we identify the work of uh, native artists, the so-called native artists from 19th century Northern India. Um, how have they been identified in art history? What are the stakes of simply identification or thinking of silences beyond identification um what does that you know how how uh, do we get into the project beyond critiquing colonial histories to think about pre-colonial concepts arts peoples in not a romanticized way because that is not simply possible uh the pre-colonial in some ways is fully uh, pre uh, fully prefigured by the colonial archive as I will uh, show today. Uh, but what does it mean to enter into concept histories while historicizing um, the very specific practices uh, and imaginaries to think of overturning colonial imaginaries? So this is an artwork that you saw on the flyer and I will return to this through the talk from a variety of vantage points. Uh, and I hope it'll help us in the discussion to um, ask the question to think, uh, to think with it uh, about broader pedagogical questions as well. So I'll start with um, talking about this example now. Um, and before I proceed, uh, can you just confirm, David, that you're able to, for some reason, uh, I'm unable to um, see myself in the small screen. So I just wanted to confirm that you can hear me all right and yes. all is proceeding well. Okay. Yes, we see you and hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, this large scale painting in gouache on cloth attributed to the artist Ghasi, hailing from the city of Udaipur in northwestern India, visualizes British India's first imperial darbar, uh, that is a formal ceremonial assembly held at Ajmer in 1832. The artist has deployed a red cloth of the tent to frame the darbar. He has depicted the seated officials on both sides, along with the bounteous gifts presented by the King of the Udaipur court, Maharana Jawan Singh to Lord William Bentick, the British East India Company's Governor General at Delhi. The painter has centralized the portraits, both the Udaipur ruler and the Governor General are depicted as equals. Yet the painter emphasizes Jawan Singh's kingly status with a green halo, an unmistakable visual code that sets their status and authority apart. The 1832 Darbar led to palpable changes in the nature of British control in Northwestern India. 
the British inability to arbitrate between the various Rajput courts when they were in conflict and its inability to assert its paramount role uh, paramount, see the key tenet in the establishment of indirect rule by the early colonial state, uh, led Governor General Bentick to embark on a tour of the region. Upon Bentick's arrival from Delhi in Ajmer, a town that had recently been brought under direct British control on January 18th, 1832, he commenced a month long darbar and met with the various regional kings who the British designated as princes. By February 24th, Bentik instituted the Rajputana agency referring to the land of the Rajputs. So while the rulers of Rajasthan courts who had identified them, who identified themselves as Hindu Rajputs, quite literally the son of kings, had controlled small and large kingdoms since pre mughal times, uh, by the late 16th century, their political and artistic histories were transcultural, mutually transformed and entirely entwined within Islamic Mughal networks and culture. In the mind of the Rajput kings and their courtly audiences, Ajmer, a key pilgrimage town, was centrally associated with the Mughals and the political and ceremonial context in which they interacted in Ajmer. By holding the 1832 Darbar, Bentik asserted British territoriality and ceremonial conduct in Ajmer. He had thus put himself directly at the helm of Rajput kings or princes, as he would call them. How do we interpret Ghassi's visualization of an emergent British empire and commemoration of the 1832 Ajmer Darbar? Its commemorative role seems singular and self-evident, yet in making this picture, the artist participates in a deeper tradition of memorializing moods of places, events, seasons, and landscapes. A preliminary drawing, slightly smaller in size, which was most likely completed on site by Ghassi, shows that the drafted composition of the tent was part of the original conception. The itinerant nature of camps held by Mughal emperors and regional kings had been the subject of earlier paintings as seen in this depiction of a 1734 Darbar held at Khiroda. The painter Jairam over here also deployed red tentage to depict the thresholds. The setting, however, of the inner realm inhabited by the Udaipur king, whom you see here, um, Sangram Singh, and the Jaipur king, Jay Singh, is far more intimate. Uh, the inner lining of the Kalamkari uh, tent panels associated with Jaipur and the tiny clumps of uh, petals placed in front of the kings assert the scented, beautiful, and appealing moods created for effective diplomacy. You can even see the gardeners uh, sorting the petals to keep the supply and scent inside the tent fresh and fragrant. Ghassi's composition um, lay claim to the incomplete pictorial plane. Gone is this essential itinerant nature of camps. His painting lends the Darbar a mood of stationary containment, uh, a kind of a studied stability almost. Mughal portraits and British landscapes. Within region specific and general surveys, art history tells the story about the introduction of the genres of portraiture and landscape painting to South Asia via a history of its empires. Those scholars have considered portraiture, objects and ideas that shape the imagining of place and landscape remains relatively underexplored. By the late 17th century, painters working in the Udaipur court workshop were at the center of pioneering material and pictorial experiments in presenting the sensorial embodied experience of space. 
they shifted their attention from making smaller genealogical and poetic manuscripts, a wide range of objects from large scale, from large scale court paintings, three to five feet long to painted invitation letters up to 72 feet long, formed representations of Udaipur's lands, forests, lakes, and bazaars, as well as Northern India's prominent temples and their bars. Um, moving beyond evaluation of art and aesthetic practices predicated on their mimetic merit, Udaipur's painters, poets, scribes, and chroniclers offered bhav, the feel, the mood, the emotion of a place as a rich layered category to perceive and for us to think with. Before I return to Ghasi's monumental darbar, I will sketch out why thinking about the moods of places on visual terms matters, first for the early modern and colonial history of South Asia, uh, for us to see what kinds of moods were elevated and how do those enable us to sense the collective memories that were being forged. And second, why does expanding our thinking on moods on visual terms matter for the intellectual history of pre-modern aesthetics uh, and relating pictures, places, and perception. In my recent book, The Place of Many Moods, I underscore the need for a broader trans-regional art history of the relations between painted lands, emotions, and territoriality. Uh, I argue that to decolonize art history, not simply in metaphorical terms, but material terms, we need to reimagine the limits of our archives and concepts and remix, if you will, our primary sources. My discussion of Ghasi's practices and agency and his mobilities uh, is related to this deeper genealogy of bhav within image making. Um, I also equally draw long and short distance mobilities and passionate localizations of place that are occurring at this time, uh, the modes of knowing, drawing, composing across mediums uh, onto uh, the same privileged ground, which they weren't necessarily seen as sharing earlier. The potentialities embedded in Ghasi's pictorial arguments, I hope, open a way for us to discuss how we can mobilize colonial India's so-called native artists within global art histories, specifically within pedagogical practices. The moods of India's long 18th century uh, mattered to two group of people. The first were the British and European observers who from the early 1700s to the 1830s in the years following the death of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb in 1707, began to establish forms of colonial economy that would eventually lead to the establishment of the British colonial state. For the British, picturesque landscapes were often used as evidence for Orientalist accounts of 18th century decline. These lands were thus in dire need of rescue by the British, and for instance, on the screen, you can see James Todd, um, the first colonial administrator in Northwestern India, who was based in Udaipur from 1799 to 1822, evocatively uh, describing the landscape of Udaipur's lakes and valley, noting the inability of his words to match its, rural, its real beauty. Todd's assistant agent, Patrick Waugh, an amateur artist on their expeditions rendered this picturesque watercolor. Here you can see how um, the water, you know, in the red square that I've marked, how the uh, water merges into bushy outcrops and the lake almost seems dried out. Todd's expresses first uh, enumerated uh, the undulating mountains, the centered lake waters, and the lake palaces, and then damned its um, royal patrons for voluptuous inactivity. He underscored, in a way, the shift in moods from prosperity to exuberance to decadence to decline. In 
it is critical to remember that Todd's efforts at political negotiations, land surveys, and documentation of princely genealogies contributed not only to the eventual publication of the region's most important history, influential history, Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, but also to the proclamation of indirect British rule in Northwestern India in 1818, uh, and eventually to the 1832 um, Indo-British Darbar, where I began the talk. Now, unlike Todd's dismissive descriptions, the work of Odaipur's painters represents an overlooked art that passionately praised places. Over the course of the long 18th century, these artworks confront and overturn British visions of territoriality, temporality, and landscape. For both politics and culture, the grounds for loyalty, personal friendship, and representation had shifted by the late 17th century. Uh, for instance, court cultures flourishing in the cities of Jaipur and Lucknow reimagined their place in distinctly local and urban ways through painting, poetry, cartography, and city building. Odaipur's painters and patrons led by Amar Singh II, the king who commissioned the monumental monsoon you see on the screen from 1705, um, uh, turned to realize the potential of their city's unique locale, uh, microclimate and natural resources, and how that could be deployed to hold their community together. The city of Odaipur could not be more distinct than uh, the former hilltop capital of Chittorgarh in its architecture, in its topography, and its memorialization. With its uh, lime-washed palaces overlooking the lakes of the city, Udaipur was established around 1559 as Mewar's capital. As a site, it evokes the imaginary of an oasis within the dry landscape. And we have, for example, vignettes from a genealogical scroll that you see on the screen from 1730, where artists have uh, emphasized this image of the life that is flourishing around a lake that is full and how this lake is fed by serpentine channels, um, uh, the, where you can see this kind of prosperity um, that, that, that is there for both the, uh, for, for those who might be residing within the more humbler quarters and for those who might be in the palace. So now I'll turn to the concept history of moods of a place as a pictorial material spatial category and, um, and uh, you know, emphasize that why it is central in helping us find many moods in India's 18th century, that is moods beyond decadence and decline. So Bhav, the prehistory of the term bhav, as I'm sure some in the audience know, was tied to the entire enterprise of literary imagination and the actualization of literary emotions and aesthetic taste, that is rasa. Pre-modern theories were concerned with the capacity of art to capture bhav, defined as an affective or physical state that could serve as a factor for inciting emotions or for constituting emotions within the audience. Foundational fourth and fifth century Sanskrit texts explain the, that works of art, especially dance and drama, should aim to create a dominant emotion through characters, gestures, and settings. The, norm, the dominant bhav, a term again encompassing emotion, mood, feeling, would lead to the ultimate aesthetic experience, ultimate aesthetic taste, that is rasa. Rasa emphasized the blending of ingredients, the physicality of emotion, something that we feel, we taste, we smell. While Bhav and Rasa were foundational to Indian aesthetics, early thinkers as well as early modern poets based their, their theories largely on literary works. The connection between Bhav and pictorial practice 
must be pieced together from inscriptions, from paintings, from very fragmentary accounts of response. Uh, and I'm giving you very select examples over here just to perk your imagination. Uh, for instance, this painted letter scroll from 1610 invites its recipient to imagine the moods of the Mughal capital of Agra, its courtly life and its prosperous urban bazaars. Uh, following the eight foot painting of, this, of city life, the text in the letter boasts that the artist who witnessed scenes of the court firsthand has captured the bhav of the moment the drums sounded. We witness the word bhav being used to describe a multi-sensory experience. Uh, the painters ha has captured not only the sights of the prosperous capital, but the eruption of sound, right? Um, in one resonant instance, the scribe is inviting you, uh, the, is inviting the monastic community who received the letter, it's inviting its audience to hear the bhav, the mood of the imperial darbar and the city. Uh, a painting made in the Udaipur court workshop almost 100 years later, um, contains an inscription that uh, on, the, on the back that further confirms the value given to an artist's ability to capture not just the illusionistic picture based on circulating paintings, but the affective experience of physical space. The scribe described the picture as depicting Kota Mela Robhav, the mood of Kota palaces. While this inscription raises, uh, this inscription and this painting raises important questions about um, the interventions and interpretations of uh, scribes, uh, the artistic adaptations that take place on the basis of many um, of, a circle, of an important circulating painting. Um, here I'll simply note that Bhav in this case is applied uh, for visual experiments, it's, it's, it's applied in a way that draws our attention to uh, the kinds of activities that are taking place, uh, to the kinds of ways in which to enter these spaces that are uh, painted by juxtaposing a variety of conventions. The subtleties of bhav infuse the term, as I argue in this broader project, with agency and potentiality on part of the poets and painters and on part of the connoisseurs who were called upon to generate memories and imaginaries by associating affect and emotions and sensorial memories of a place. The visualization of moods of real places created worlds that far superseded material and living examples, uh, reflecting the ideational power of Udaipur's painters. The elevating of moods within monumental artworks thus created the potential for objects to perform a variety of affective and efficacious work. Uh, they are revealed less as documents and more as effective means of recalling moods of historical time, the longing for ephemeral times and idealized times, and the bonding of urban men with their lands. Over the 140 years of the long 18th century, when forms of colonial economy and colonial modernity gained ground, the formation of new political communities in Udaipur increasingly depended on the king's relations with regional kings, and even more so with his ties to local elites who populated his daily courts, um, similar to the kind of gathering that you saw in this uh, darbar that I showed you at the beginning. The study of Udaipur paintings thus, you know, uh, contributes a uh, form of art history that was synchronic with Eurasia's own interest in establishing sociability in the creation of circumscribed assemblies, pleasure gardens, coffee houses. 
Uh, and it tells us that to historicize emotions, not as psychological states, but as collectively learned practices that may lead to sustained states of feelings, that is moods, um, that the concept of attunements that Sara Ahmed highlights is something that could be useful. Based on Heidegger's conception, Ahmed says attunements are not side effects, but we first immerse ourselves in each atmosphere, which then attunes us through and through. The creation of attunements in the first place is then to be transported into a mood that requires the work of building atmospheres. It was pertinent as Udaipur's patrons, painters, poets, and architects reveal to rebuild exclusive moods, to represent idealized moods, to reiterate pleasures, for attuning to take effect in an ever-changing group of elite participants. This extraordinary iteration of pleasure and plentitude across artworks reveals the alluring power of celebratory, monumental, and prosperous moods. And these kinds of paintings then possess the power to create painted worlds on paper, on cloth, on walls, but also in our minds to elevate certain memories, to make certain times memorable. These moods of plentitude and pleasure and piousness that praised places um, emerged before and alongside those that classified South Asia's lands as landscapes of decline and decadence. So it's, I, I consider critical artifacts like this 1832 Ajmer Darbar uh, that captures a political mute, right? That shows us the artistic practice of deliberating the political mood within a certain kind of panegyrical excess alongside the colonial archive of travels, drawings, and diplomatic correspondence that has been given prominence to consider the territorial shifts in the long 18th century. So with this, let me turn to the artist Ghasi. The artist Ghasi's oeuvre provides a rare vantage point to understand the circulation of pictorial ideas across courtly and colonial worlds. Between 1820 and 1834, Ghasi painted under the patronage of two Indian kings and one British agent. In the early years of the 19th century, Ghasi painted small, smaller portraits of Maharana Bhim Singh mounted on a horse, accompanied by his entourage of men and hunting dogs poised in a procession. When he traveled with Todd, Ghasi also made several small um, and large drawings of elevations, architectural details of temples, deploying fine watercolor outlines on, often on watermarked European paper. He also employed the topoi of processions from Udaipur court paintings to portray Todd and his diplomatic encounters with the courtry world. From about 1832 to 1835, he returned to the Udaipur court workshop and he painted the then King Jawan Singh in several large scale cloth and paper paintings, picturing him with an expansive architectural environs of temples, palaces, and camps. He participates in the consistent proclivity of painters and poets to enhance the affective power of empirical expressions, drawing readily yet precisely between deeper temporalities and panegyric traditions into the kinds of historical presence that he is elevating. My broader work on, uh, based on this material examines this double movement between Ghasi's and Todd's endeavors, and thereby the relationship between picturing the moods of places and asserting the epistemic and, and the assertion of epistemic and political authority that we see within Todd's writing and essays. 
for example, Todd's essay on the geography of Rajasthan and annal, in the annals along with the collections he amassed reveals that he deployed a range of place-centric representations and multiple methods of surveying. Today, I'm restricting the discussion largely to Ghasi, but as most studies have uh, have noted Todd was a trained engineer and was the conduit by which a court painter like um, Ghasi would have received training in architectural drafting. That is how, what I mean to say is that that is how most studies have uh, characterized Ghasi. Uh, this tacit assumption implies that Ghasi as a painter did not acquire any learning from the court workshop, uh, wherein drawing the architecture of real places while capturing their moods had been a central concern since circa 1700. Examining the diverse kinds of preparatory material that taught contributed uh, to the published annals eliminates the expertise of local artists and map makers. Ghasi's ways of knowing architecture and making large-scale paintings displayed in the intermediary stages of drawings prepared for the Udaipur court and Todd's documentation projects thus provide a thick and circumscribed archive. So, for example, the engravings of temple sites and architectural details based on Khasi's drawings uh, are largely published within the personal narrative of Todd's uh, Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, uh, in the, which is located in volume two. Um, these include columns, ceilings, temple towers uh, of a variety of uh, sites. You can see from the drawing that you have on the, uh, from the engraving that you have on the uh, screen that Ghasi is uh, not interested in the pictorial possibilities presented by Todd's uh, uh, other artist assistant, uh, Patrick Waugh. Uh, that is Patrick Waugh's picturesque sketches that I showed you earlier. Rather, he's interested in drawing the architecture of sites he visited by getting up close, by uh, drawing each particular curve, uh, by getting into the details of the carvings. Um, you can see that he depicts each of the sculpted figures in the temples in detail. Um, we see that he creates these plans that you see on the right of the ceilings that are there within, uh, within temples. Um, you find that there is a very systematic project of drawing architecture that is at play over here because most of his uh, drawings on which the engravings uh, are based are nearly on same sized uh, sheets of paper. In some cases, you find that two sheets of paper are joined and you can see this join over here. Uh, okay, let me go back. Um, you hear details about how he's at work on a particular drawing um, and he is take you know and the amount of time he's taking to create that detail so for example Todd writes that Ghasi is now at work on the outline of two remaining shrines and he has promised to give up 10 days to the details of the ceilings the columns the rich and varied ornaments which his pencil alone can um, represent right uh, so we just see this kind of descriptive detail that is there in his drawings and it's in those instances that we hear Todd uh, surrender, surrender his narrative to the efficacy of Ghasi's representation, right? Uh, it's not in showing some of these drawings to you uh, that, uh, we, uh, that we don't see, um, that we don't have earlier examples for uh, of this kind of detailed work being done uh, in earlier Udaipur paintings. Uh, but there is a different kind of systematic project that we have uh, access to over here, which gives us a sense of perhaps uh, 
preparatory drawing that were drawings that were used by earlier artists as well uh, that have not necessarily survived. Um, this is a very interesting group over here because we see these drawings on local paper, uh, which most likely constituted the artist's preparatory drawings of architectural elements based on which uh, the more detailed drawings were produced, which were then combined to produce these kind of uh, elevations that are engraved for Todd's panels. So with this kind of longer history in mind of uh, Ghasi's, um, Ghasi's work for Todd, um, it, it's useful to go to his artistic practice, especially after 1822, uh, when he returns to the court. 1822 is when Todd departs Udaipur. It opens up a critical space to think comparatively uh, of not only how Todd co-opted Ghasi's drawings within a narrative of ruination and decline, but more provocatively to rethink how Ghasi employed the vocabulary of elevation drawings um, within courtly idioms of praise. Uh, what we see is that Ghasi realigns the bhav of a place, especially the mood of royal portraiture within temple spaces and the pilgrimages of Jawan Singh, the same king who was depicted in that big darbar painting as a means to assert the king's power in the wake of British colonization. Two impressive paintings um, that you see on the screen depict Jawan Singh's visit to the uh, to two temples, one in the Vishnupat temple at Gaya uh, and another major temple in Banaras. Uh, both can be uh, attributed to Ghasi, both are most likely commemorative in nature. Uh, because we have the entire documentation of a pilgrimage tour that Jawan Singh took between 1833 and 1834 uh, to, uh, the, to the cities in uh, Northern India, to the important temple cities in Northern India, including Mathura, Vrindavan, Allahabad, Banaras, Gaya, and so on. Uh, as we can see over here, the artist centralizes the elevation of the temple shrine and the picture is framed by the representation of the uh, representation of the arched arcade that created a boundary for the temple courtyard. Um, the painter's use of oblique lines that project outward from the planimetric view of the temple courtyard recalls pictorial strategies adopted by earlier artists who depict the courtyards of other uh, buildings uh, in Udaipur, like the Lake Palace uh, of Jagnivas. So here, by composing the entrance of the temple, which abuts the lower edge of the paper and is aligned along the central axis of the temple elevation, we see how this feeling of being in the interiors of the devotional precinct is given to the image, right? The same kind of uh, um, strategy is used in the other painting as well. It's in fact, even more uh, reinforced uh, because of the ways in which the brown hues are used, the modes in which you have the portrait of the king repeated on multiple instances. Uh, but what really stands out over here is that even when we are not looking at the drawings Kasi made for um, a temple for Todd, which is not the same temple, we can see how his work for the annals is, uh, is something that he's thinking through, that he is refracting in reimagining these larger paintings in changing the direction that they take in circulating back to the Udaipur court and in picturing the king's devotional journeys, 
Ghasi seems to side both from within court painting traditions and from the visuality of these individually framed vertical drawings of temple elevations that he prepared for Todd. Uh, his picturing in this case seems like a complex translation that is mediating genre, style, conventions, architectural knowledge, uh, that, that gives us insights into his own tra travels and training. Um, you know, there are multiple paintings that he makes, and even if I uh, will not go into the details of these other paintings that I have for you, um, you can see, uh, you know, it's worth highlighting that they are about uh, of the same size as the uh, as the darbar painting uh, and as the temple painting that you just saw they're all making departures in certain ways from paintings that came just before them uh, to again highlight this kind of a quality of the elevation and the size of these paintings um, and it's so in a way we get this insight into his modes of seeing and how he's altering the modes of seeing of his patrons, right? Um, here I have actually a painting from circa 1700, just to again give you a sense that if we are thinking about these kinds of modes of knowing, uh, modes of knowledge, modes of drawing, modes of composing. Um, we have temple drawings that were equally elaborate going back to circa 1700. But as you look at this painting that I show you of the King Amar Singh in devotion, what it doesn't have is that frontal efficacy of uh, that is that is uh, or the frontal elevation that is uh, prioritized within Ghasi's paintings, right? So this brings me back to the darbar and how do we look at it? Uh, now this question of architectural framing, the visual presentation of diplomacies of pilgrimage of why that was elevated, why that was changed, uh, is something that we can get insight into by thinking as to how the question of seeing the darbar was emphasized in the making of this painting. I'll sidestep for a few minutes to the reams of diplomatic correspondence that records how the East India Company and the Udaipur court dwelled on the concerns of the Udaipur court regarding how they would be seen in the Darbar. Uh, this correspondence written by the court secretary Munshi Sher Singh Mehta insists on protocol. Uh, there is a question answer exchange on the seating instruction uh, that will pertinent to the question of what the image of the Udaipur king will be, uh, or what is the kind of image of the Udaipur king that the Darbar will create. The Udaipur court, uh, for its part, uh, insists that European chairs must be provided for the governor general and Jawan Singh in the uh, Mewari version. So where there is an English version of this correspondence, uh, and there is a Mewari version, the regional language and the regional court documents of this correspondence. And there are the words that are used for the notion that, uh, that the king and his nobles cannot be rendered equal. Our Maharana Sahib ki or unki barabari nahi dikhegi. That is the equality of the Udaipur ruler and his kings will not be seen if chairs are used only for Jawan Singh and the governor general. The response from Bentek's office to this request states, a separate elevated seat will be prepared for his lordship and the Maharana, but the arrangement uh, by the arrangement, the dignity of the Maharana will be preserved from the appearance of being reduced to at par with that of his Sardars. But it is the custom of the Governor General Sardar that all who are entitled to sit shall have chips. Uh, 
this kind of anxiety about how the darbar would be visually perceived may be may have served as part of the impetus of ghasi's travels with the royal party to ajmer and thus for his detailed visualization of the darbar in the large cloth painting it shows that ultimately the governor general bentek's custom was reinstated everyone sat on chairs um the maharana and the governor general share a long throne like ceremonial seat even so it embodies the hierarchical structure of the gathering um so if we um if we um actually um uh, go back to this um uh, particular uh, you know if we look uh, further into this uh, painting uh, we can see how that uh you know of course there are codes of the mughal darbar that are being used that those who were closest to the king were the most powerful in the court um the artist has centralized the portraits of uh both the king uh and the governor general okay but we again have that green halo that is setting him apart we have the rent tents which is again coming from a much longer uh tradition of depiction of these tented spaces um but what we are seeing over here if we start thinking of all of this entire corpus together is that we are not necessarily seeing just a story of co-production of knowledge say between uh, what ghasi is contributing to todd's project but more so after ghasi returns to the court of contestation of moods and memories in equally generative epistemic images that are commissioned by the court um it's useful to recall that ghasi's more religiously themed paintings were made just within 2 years of the 1832 darbar his exploitation of this new idiom seems to assert the authority of the poor kings in a period of waning power by drawing upon a lexicon of religious pilgrimage networks instead of the political ones political correspondence between the udaipur court and british officers at delhi uh, and ajmer on jawan singh's pilgrimage further suggest that the king could have um, commissioned these paintings as a way to assert his power uh, you have the, all this correspondence that is complaining about why he is taking these extensive pilgrimages so we can think of them even um as a kind of a very specific calculated strategy to align themselves with other geographies um instead of uh, what we find in the colonial archive that they that these pilgrimages are evidence of jawan singh's lack of interest in politics and economics of their city um it's it's interesting to also go back to this darbar and look at these gifts again um the there is a way in which they tell us about how ghasi has combined realist and anti illusionist uh take idioms um by creating this focus in the darbar uh, or disrupting the focus of the darbar from the center with this painted grid of gifts that were offered by the maharana to bentex party the outline of the rectangular gifts are barely visible in um, ghasi's preliminary drawing it is in the painting showing bright colored cloth wraps that their material form is fully realized uh, the display's geometric and abstract pattern disrupts this symmetry of the tented space it also forms this kind of block which is seemingly floating off the planar space it signals the formalizing of a new political arrangement but it also remains disconnected from both the parties if ghasi's large scale darbar commemoration was an artwork the maharana meant to present to the governor general then this picture of shared authority certainly seems to accord greater power to the gift giver than to the receiver so 
with with this i want us to um i want us to then think what does it mean to mobilize this kind of back and forth this kind of modes of knowing and knowledge making in different genres that we see um how to how do we think about uh, the, these kind of pictures in the kind of uh, histories and uh, we seek to lay out in our new curriculums right uh, if modes in which um, in modes in which these kinds of artists uh, were uh, identified in the colonial archive somewhat limited their agency and by entering into different archives we are finding a way to think about their agency in more complicated ways uh, then it's worth uh, thinking about that what is a kind of affective intellectual and political work uh, that has been done in making these kind of pictures uh, can be instructive for us uh, to think about the approaches that we bring in teaching of global art histories. Um, it's, it's worth kind of again going back to the question of uh, uh, the, to the question of land, uh, to the question of how we teach about land and landscapes, um, how we define those genres only through certain objects in specific terms. Um, and what comes to my mind is how, um, you know, scholars of uh, critical geography remind us in understanding native lands that how there is always an open sense of place that is functioning in how uh, how memories of land and attachments to places are recounted right or therefore spaces and pictures about the moods of lands also seem to be constantly bound up in these kind of uh, a, association of pictures of moods that are drawn on paper, felt in place, evoked in read and recited poetry. Um, and they seem to include this trace of embodied memories and experiences. Um, and in, go, in going back and forth between these collections between these various trajectories, uh, we have to almost insert ourselves in different idioms to find how places emerge, not just as points on a map on the surface of on the surface of a map, but almost how they emerge as these integrations of events that are constantly unfolding uh, with each entry into the archive. Um, so with that, I, I want to stop and uh, hear from you as to um, hear from you as to how you um, how you are seeing Ghasi's agency and what kind of arguments come to your mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kara, for that uh, rich, thought-provoking, um, illuminating talk. Um, we have members of the History of Art Graduate Students Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Committee who will moderate a uh, question and answer uh, portion of the, the afternoon with you for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'll, I'll ask, uh, I see Rachel Quist on screen, ask her to, to help with that. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you also so much for that uh, for that wonderful talk. It was a real pleasure to learn from you, and I'm excited for the uh, oncoming conversation. So we've got several comments and questions in the chat. A lot of people applauding and thanking you. And I'll just start with a question from Mary Frances Ivy, who asked, 
Um, Professor Kara, thank you so much for your lecture. Could you share with us about methodological, uh, sorry, methodologies for researching moods in the archive, how to ascertain them, how to contextualize them, and what are the challenges in this work and how do you respond to those challenges? Uh, thank you, uh, Mary Frances, for such a small question. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I think you raise a very important point about both historicizing and methodological challenges, right? So I talk about this in the larger project in the book that to moods are very difficult to pin down, right? They're very difficult to describe even in our present times, uh, perhaps more so in our present times when we are going through these kind of fluctuating <laughs> moods between every, from minute to minute, given the kind of circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, so whether we are thinking about historical moods, whether we are thinking of contemporary moods across time, they are very difficult to, uh, they're very difficult to pin down, they're very difficult to excavate, they're very difficult to research, right? Uh, and one thing that emerges from the archive that I'm looking at is that the only mode in which the question of uh, moods can be addressed is twofold. One is that they make sense only if one is able to think about the potential effects of mood in particular times. So for example, with Ghassi's uh, paintings that elevate the mood of pilgrimages, of certain piousness of certain landscapes, right? Uh, makes them larger than uh, what paintings were at this time, right? Uh, so that is giving you a certain kind of a cue to a certain kind of potentiality that is at place that there is this desire, it seems to affect in a certain way. Um, and why is the, uh, why is this affect, why is the size being emphasized to this extent? Why are numerous pilgrimage paintings being commissioned? And we are able to historicize that by only going into a different set of archive where there are complaints about this pilgrimage and what is it that it's going to achieve? So there seems to be a lot at stake in elevating a certain pictorial mood, in expanding a particular pictorial mood in size and in numbers of commissions, right? Um, so that itself is your instance of historicizing, which is your method, one of the important methodological en route into thinking about how one evaluates moods. Um, and in order to do that, you have to go into multiple mediums. So in this case, I'm going into correspondence that I'm finding um, in an entirely separate space. Uh, in other cases, when I'm looking at certain moods of pleasure within lake palaces or the mood of the monsoon within a lake city, which is elevated, say, in the early 1700s or lay, the moods of pleasures of lake palaces elevated in the 1750s, I'm finding a variety of uh, apart from the painted sources, I've found a lot of poetic sources which praise these uh, seasons, say of the monsoon uh, and so on, or lake palaces like, as ideal spaces for the experience of pleasure for people to come together. Uh, but then also I have poetry uh, or rather like, you know, ground reports about like, how were the rains this year? Was there a drought season? Was it a, how, how important were rains for a certain kind of, uh, um, for a certain kind of kingdom, for a certain kind of kingship to prevail, if you will, right? Um, so in some ways, what I find is that to access moods, you have to go into the history of aesthetics where we are finding that certain moods are emphasized, say for example, the moods of the monsoon has a very particular, very deep history within the subcontinent, within Indian aesthetics, the mood of spring. You have to go into the pictorial archive as to 
what moods are really coalescing at a particular time? Why are they leaping out of an archive? Uh, you have to go into those, studying those spaces. And is there a way in which that they are being, uh, that you get a sense of the affect and experience of those spaces actually only by looking at the pictorial and the poetic moods? Uh, you're going to uh, the archives and literature within political correspondence between daily political diaries, if you will. And in some ways, then moods of a place uh, historicized and with potential affects, which, is, which remains an open-ended question. You can't 100% pin down the affect of a mood, but you still get enough to think with it, right? Um, emerges only in between all of these lines of inquiry. Um, you go with the Ghasi painting, with this Darbar painting, um, you know, and if you think about a large scale painting as such, you're going away from it, and then you're going really close to these very, finely painted works, which were me meant to be seen almost um, really very close to your eyes. So you're quite literally and metaphorically going closer and going further away, going sideways and coming back. And if we think about the question of sensing of what how moods color our memories, how moods are meaningful, how our memories are caught up in moods. In some ways, this ephemeral um, sense of them that you can't touch them completely is a part of it. I hope that answers your question to some extent. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we have time for one or two more questions. So I'll jump into one from uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, thank you, first of all, uh, for your wonderful talk. And Michael wrote, how would an image of this type and size be viewed? And where would the viewer's eyes start and then subsequently travel to within the spatial elements? That's a great question. And it's a question that, you know, historians in my field have been trying to ask for a while. We do not have a written history of reception which tells us how these large paintings were seen. We so, you know, they were not framed and put up on walls the way we see them in galleries today. Um, so I've tried to look for cues in the kind of, um, in the ways they were made, in the ways, uh, if you try to consider their sizes, how they would have required attendance to perhaps show them to you, or they would be laid out on a floor. In some of them, we do have, uh, instances where they can be entered in, if you will, from a variety, from all of the four sides. So you start imagining a gathering of people who would be sitting all around them. What you're seeing over here or what you're seeing in the works from 1820s to 1835 that I've largely shown you, we see this axis that is governed by the elevation that is emphasized a lot. So in that sense, there is that kind of an orientation that we find. Um, how and where a viewer's eyes would start and subsequently travel is a question that I think we enter in with these paintings as much in our time as we try to think about how our historical audiences would have done it. Um, you know, sometimes the inscriptions help us. Uh, I've found because the inscriptions do identify often many of the people. You, some of these paintings have very large inscriptions on their verso. Um, in other cases, you just have a pithy inscriptions that this is depicting the pleasure, the mood of pleasure at a particular time, or the mood of a place, or the mood of a certain festival. So in that case, um, you are really entering into it. Um, you could enter into it from a variety of uh, um, vantage points. And I think they invite entry from a variety of vantage points. There is a fascinating uh, entry that I found within a quarterly diary where 
Uh, you hear about paintings that are being brought out for consumption during a particular gathering, and then the scribes are being called to inscribe on them. So you start then thinking that the inscriptions in a way are a response, are an event in themselves, uh, where it's an instantiation of a space of reception of an assembly, rather than thinking about them as identifiers, which is how they have been used within a catalog. Um, so that is again, something for us to think through um, and thinking that how do we identify and why would we not enter these paintings from a variety of um, subject positions. And I think that they invite entering from many, many subject positions and the artists are very, you know, clever about that. And, and that opens them up to, to multiple interpretations in each gathering. Uh, so there might be a different gathering of scholars, of uh, connoisseurs who might enter a different vantage point um, for the same painting as it happens with any archive. Thank you so much. And um, it's just such an honor to hear someone speaking with so much knowledge and passion about the subject area. It's really been such an honor to, to hear from, from you about this topic. And um, for, for time reasons, uh, we might not have time for another, David, but, but Dr. Kenaforis, I'll, de I'll defer to you on that. Um, but we can also send a, a record of everyone's questions to you as well to make sure that you get to see everything that people asked. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Kataforis? Well, we, we advertised an ending time of 2.30, so we're just about there. But um, you've opened up uh, uh, so many uh, avenues of, of thought and exploration for us, and we're grateful to you for that. I'm sure many of us are going to seek out your, your published research as well to, to delve more deeply into these um, questions that you're pursuing and approaches that you are uh, developing uh, that are that are certainly productive, and and we look forward to staying in touch with you uh, after this event. Uh, we feel like we've made a new connection that that we very much value, and we really appreciate what you've brought to us uh, this afternoon, Dr. Kara. Likewise, I want to thank all of you again because you've introduced me to the amazing roster of conversations that are taking place at the Crest Department of Art History at University of Kansas. So. Um, thanks for enabling all of us to partake in those very important conversations. If you were here physically, you would hear the round of applause that is being um, remotely uh, 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 voiced. And, and uh, uh, again, thank you. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, seeing your future projects as they develop as well. Thank you. Please check the department website uh, for the um, information about the remaining two lectures in our series happening over the next two months. Thank you.